All right. This is uh, uh, the second part of the nine part uh, uh, lecture series on world religions and modern secularism. Uh, we're moving now from uh, the early uh, philosophers and uh, uh, on down to Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and now we're moving into uh, the uh, first century period. And this is interesting to us as a, as Christians, as uh, Christianity comes into onto the world scene in in the first century with Christ and then his followers, and it will Christianity will spread very rapidly in this very uh, pluralistic world of the first century. Now, of course, Judaism had been around a while, uh, and. Uh, and it was just one of many worldviews of the ancient world. And pretty much all the world views of that time period, the belief in gods and goddesses and philosophical thinking, uh, had some aspect of spiritual dimension in them. Uh, but you had the monotheistic view, which contrasts with the many types of polytheistic worldviews in besides polytheism yet you know theistic uh view you know yeah believe in multiple gods but you follow one of them uh type of thing so you got polytheism but there's multiple religions in uh, the polytheistic world so that world of the first century was extremely diverse and so christianity uh, coming after out of judaism and some uh ways and uh it enters into this very pluralistic world uh as uh, as fulfilling the uh prophesied messiah that the messiah would come and the messiah was going to be for all people not just for the jews although the jews some of them didn't see it that way uh so the, the message of jesus as the savior of the world would through the christian faith bring changes in these uh uh, first centuries and on in uh, to a uh, um, couple of millennia. And so uh, uh, these first few centuries was laying the foundation for the for a Christian worldview that's uh, still present to this very day. And but you got to remember that uh, besides the Jewish worldview, which would have been similar, uh, the Christian worldview was going to be very different from the worldviews of that time period, particularly the polytheistic uh, thinking of the gods and goddesses. Uh, but on the other hand, you had the philosophers who didn't pay much attention to the gods and goddesses, uh, but they had some thoughts that uh, would relate to Christian thinking, and uh, and Christian thinking could even take some of the philosophers' own words and use them in uh m teaching about christianity as well and we'll see a little bit of that as we go along um here's an example uh you know if we think about paul especially is uh, we see this in his writings more than anything else uh any other writers uh you know him being raised in tarsus he, although he became a rabbi, you know, and became a, a, a in the Pharisaic sect, uh, he grew up in Tarsus so at a time when it was the center of a lot of philosophical teaching, and uh, even more so than Athens, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, you know, he would have been familiar with a lot of the philosophy of the time, as well as the Old Testament uh, from his uh, training as a rabbi. Uh, you get examples of this. Uh, I'm going to just go through some examples. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communication corrupts good manners. Uh, yeah, this was uh, Meander, a, a writer of the 3rd century BC, uh, who was supposed to have quoted another scholar named Euripides, uh, said a similar thing. And uh, Titus 1, 12, one of their themselves, a prophet of their own, writing to Titus, and he's quoting, you know, or paraphrasing, Epimenides uh, said, Cretans are always liars and evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Uh, 
in, uh, in writing to Titus Paul, just quoting this guy and, uh, you know, saying they've made this observation and uh, Titus being in Crete, you know, he's saying you've got your work cut out for you. But uh, it's interesting that uh, Paul is familiar with the philosophy and writings of the time, which as a highly educated guy, that would tend to be the case. Uh, Acts 17 is uh, one of the uh, interesting parts when Paul's on uh, Areopagus, Mars Hill, and uh, uh, but he's been uh, walking around Athens and he encounters uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And uh, he says, uh, you know, basically the uh, first uh, sentence struck directly at the Epicurean's theory of the origin of the world by mere coincidence and atoms. And, uh, and basically kind of was more on the side of uh, the Stoics, you know, which is with their doctrine of a divine wisdom of providence uh, creating and ruling all things. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so his speech uh, uh, has some of the words from a Roman Stoic philosopher called uh, Lucius Annius Seneca, or we just call him Seneca for short. Um, and he, he, he's a contemporary of Paul, which is uh, interesting. And so, uh, but he is a Stoic philosopher. And Stoicism, it, its philosophy and uh, its ethics uh, has a lot in common with some Christian teaching. So I think Paul recognizes that and uses it uh, to his advantage in teaching about uh, Christianity. So in Acts 17, for example, Paul said, God's, God made of one every nation of men to dwell in, on the face of the earth. Well, Seneca, and that, the philosopher, well, he says, we are a member of a vast body. Nature made us kin when she produced us from the same thing and to the same ends. And, uh, and so, but, you know, the Stoics' view of God, they may think of him uh, as this uh, in, this force of divine wisdom and so forth. God is personalizing it. Well, it's the God of Judaism and the, uh, the God of Christianity is going to be different. But yet some of these words would have sounded familiar to uh, the philosophers of the time. Uh, God, Paul goes on to say, God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, if you remember that, uh, in Acts 17. Uh, Seneca wrote, God is at hand everywhere and to all men. And again, God is near to thee. He is with thee. He is within. You know, so you can see some of the commonality of phrasing uh, between Paul and Seneca. And uh, so when the uh philosophers were listening to Paul uh, on Areopagus, you know, uh, his words would have sounded uh, somewhat familiar, but yet different. And he would be challenging them by saying he's going to show who the unknown God is. But uh, same thing, Acts 17, 28b, Paul says, for we are also his offspring. Now, this one, Paul is quoting a poet uh and that uh, people would have been familiar with that he even says paul even says certain of your poets and poets oftentimes could be philosophers as well uh and that poet was aratus and uh this is uh his line for we are also his offspring can be found in his work phenomena of aratus and so uh we can go back and actually find uh, these this quote, and, and uh, Paul gives him credit. He says, "You know, this is your own poets are making my point." And so, you early on you see Paul using philosophy uh, that people would have been familiar with. Now, Paul was great at uh, you know uh, contextualizing his message. He knew who his audience was when he went and talked to the Jews in the synagogue. He talked about Abraham and Isaac and you know, and the promise of the coming Messiah and things. But when he talked to Gentiles, he wouldn't start there. He would talk, start talking about God. 
And here with these philosophers, things not only talking about God, but he's also point, pointing out that some of their own philosophy is pointing in the direction he's pointing them. And so uh, Acts 17, uh, 29, uh, being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or device of men. Uh, Seneca has a parallel thought. Thou shalt not form him of silver and gold. A true likeness of God cannot be molded of this material. So Seneca, being a good Stoic philosopher, realizes that that's you know, you can't make uh, you know a likeness of God, and uh, and so you know this would not be unusual uh, for people who understood Stoic philosophy, uh, and so he, they would see some commonality probably in this, but certainly uh, as he goes further into his teaching. They're going to find there is some radical differences. Um, in Galatians 5.23b, Paul says, Against such there is no law. Uh, uh, in Romans 2.14b, Paul says, Are a law unto themselves. And uh, so when he's talking about uh, those who are not under the law, they were law unto themselves. Paul's uh, words are eerily familiar to Aristotle, saying, uh, "Men uh, eminent for wisdom and virtue, against such there is no law, for they themselves are a law." And uh, is Paul quoting, you know, or referring to Aristotle? Who who knows? But you can see the familiarity in some of this, and uh, you know, uh, Paul uh, will. Uh, may, you know, would be using words that were familiar to people, and he would put the concepts of Christian belief in words that would be familiar to people so they could understand it. So we shouldn't be surprised to see some correlations. It doesn't necessarily mean he's actually quoting them. Um, Acts 1724, Paul went on to say, God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Seneca, uh, his contemporary, uh, uh, put the doctrine in these words, the whole world is the temple of the immortal gods and temples are not to be built to God, uh, to God of stones piled on high. Uh, he must be consecrated in the heart of every man. And so, uh, you know, so again, you know, you could see the usage of gods and gods in Stoicism's uh, view of what God is. Uh, but they too would be a very agreeable, you know, that God doesn't dwell in physical temples uh, made with people's hands. Uh, so uh, again, we we see, you know, that uh, uh, you have this overlap, and uh, he's talking within an environment where and using words that already were, had meaning to them. Uh, Acts uh, 17, uh, 25, um, and uh, Paul said, Neither is God served by men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he himself giveth to all life and breath and all things. Uh, Seneca put, put out some, something similar. Uh, God wants, uh, wants not ministers, also he himself ministereth to the human race. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, again, not necessarily quoting, but just realize that Paul is actually, uh, uh, you know, using things, uh, using uh, words and thoughts that would not have been totally unfamiliar, but he's going to move them towards a understanding of Christianity, because as he goes on in Acts 17, he's going to start talking about it. Jesus, who comes and then dies and is resurrected, of course, that is really radically different from anything that any of the philosophers would have been talking about. And so that in itself is going to uh, change uh, uh, their uh, perspective on things. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, going forward here, oops, I just messed that up. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're going to uh, 
talk about the patristic period, uh, which uh, basically uh, is uh, the time period from the second century uh, to uh, the uh, eighth centuries. Um, it's generally considered a span from the end of the first century when the New Testament was almost complete. Uh, you know, the, basically the end of the apostolic age around AD 100, just in general terms, uh, to either the Council of Chalcedon in 451 or the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. Kind of depends on how people break up the history. Uh, patristics, the Latin word pater, father, is the study of early Christian writers who are designated as the church fathers. So that's where you get the word patristic period uh, for that. And this is a period in which uh, we'll continue to see, uh, you know, the, the philosophies of the time are still going on and, uh, and people are still familiar with it. Uh, and uh, so there, there's this, there's going to be this debate. How much can you use of the philosophy to, to clarify the gospel, to clarify God's word and stuff like that to the people? And there were disagreements on this. Uh, in that time period. Um, so part of the post-apostolic uh, to, to the time of what we will call Christendom, in way I divide it in my class of history, I would say uh, post-apostolic to the founding of the church by the Catholic Church in uh, 312, uh, or the Edict of Milan by uh, Constantine, is a, a period, and after that, that's still part of the, uh, uh, what will be called the patristic period. It goes on past that, but um, there are other ways of dividing it. Uh, you have uh, like Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who was martyred, burned at the stake in 155. Uh, and so you have, uh, you know, persecution going on uh, during this time period up to the Edict of Milan period, and the persecutions would go on, on off and on against Christianity. But despite all of this, uh, uh, Christians were establishing schools, and the Christian leaders, uh, the post-apostolic uh, uh, fathers, the church leaders, would start uh, four main schools. And uh, so you have in Alexandria, Egypt, Pantinus of Alexandria. Um, we don't know the exact date of his birth, but uh, died in about 194. Then he had uh, Clement, 150 to 215, and then Origen. These would be the guys who would carry on the school in Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, so realize uh, very early on, Christians were uh, highly involved in the higher education, as we call it today, uh, thinking. In other words, they, like Paul, would enter into dialogue with thinkers of the day, uh, the philosophers uh, of the day, and same with uh, uh, the others, the church fathers, as they would go forward. Uh, you have a school starting in Carthage in North Africa under Tertullian, uh, 165 to 240, later Cyprian, who was later martyred. Uh, and so you see you have Egypt, then Carthage and North Africa, and then Antioch of Syria, which uh, we're aware of where Paul worked out of um, in his missionary journeys. And uh, it goes back to Ignatius of Antioch, uh, 50 to 110, uh, who was uh, martyred, later martyred under Trajan, uh, later uh, Tatian, uh, and then Justin Martyr. All th these guys, you can, a lot of them, you can have access to the the, the writings, the writings, and uh, see what they wrote about. Uh, but they started these schools, and out of these schools, uh, they would do mission work. They would go out and share the gospel. So kind of realize that, yeah, they have a school, but they don't just stay there. They actually send out missionaries. They actually go out themselves. And then lastly, Rome uh, in Italy uh, is associated with Papias, 70 to 155. 
later Irenaeus would be one of the main ones, and Eusebius, who wrote the first history of Christianity um, outside the Bible, and uh, uh, you know, and he would make reference to the writings of Papias, but we've lost the writings of Papias. We have they have not turned up, and uh, people would love to see if those writings ever came about, uh, came in where we could find them. So, uh, but, uh, so you had uh, Christianity spreading in the, the Roman Empire, and it had centers of education. And so we have to remember that Christianity as a whole has always uh, had a strong emphasis on education, and eventually after the time of persecution, and it becomes uh, more established to religion and legal, uh, these schools would emerge even further uh, in churches and monasteries and become centers of education for everyone, not just the elite people, which is what philosophers did. They taught the elite of their time period, uh, not just the common people got to do that. So, uh, so the church fathers generally divided into early scholars known as the anti-Nicene fathers, those who lived and wrote before the Council of Nicaea in 325, and the later Nicene and post-Nicene fathers, those who lived and wrote after 325. Uh, and sometimes they're also divided as the Greek scholars, the earlier ones, and then Latin scholars, uh, the later ones. All right, now when you uh, look at the writings, one of the things uh, um, you can see is they had different views related to the use of philosophy and explaining the gospel message. Some were, okay, we can use philosophic categories and thoughts and words and ideas from philosophy to explain the Christian message. Others were saying, no, you should avoid that. And so you get this kind of dichotomy. And so early on, you see that Christian scholars were uh, discussing and you know saying, well, how much can you use of philosophy? Because philosophy has some things that are in it that are wrong. So, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't use philosophy. So you got this uh, thing, and I, I divided, you know, those who are willing to use more cultural things like uh, philosophy. You got Justin Martyr uh, and uh, Clement Alexander are examples of those who say, it's okay to use philosophical categories to explain Christianity and, uh, you know, uh, put it more in the context of the culture of the time. And so they were willing to do that more than like Tatian over here and Tertullian. Uh, they took the view, well, Christians are pilgrims in the world and we should stay away, you know, from the uh, world and uh, the influence of philosophy, which can bring negative things into Christianity. And of course, that's always a risk if you do, uh, you know, you know want to make things understandable to people. Uh, you could, you know, take things that may not be Christian, totally biblical and you know, fall in the trap of following some philosophical idea that really isn't what the Bible is saying. And, uh, but on the other hand, you need to be able to communicate to people. And so I think as the years would go by, for the most part, Christianity would go with in this direction uh, more and uh, say, well, we need to make the gospel understandable to people in the culture. And if a philosophical uh, wording uh, helps to explain that, that's okay. Uh, but uh, there are people that still, even to this day, would react and, uh, against that and say, no, we shouldn't do that. But uh, so uh, this uh, difference and the variance back down here is just showing that some could be very much in this direction, but some, you know, you know, would use it sparingly while others wouldn't use it at all. But uh, so that's just to know that even the early scholars of Christianity uh, debated how much you could use philosophy and stuff. But later, we're going to see Aristotelian thought and uh, uh, other aspects. Plato will enter into some of uh, Christianity's thinking. All right, so uh, uh, so the this patristic period is a precursor to what we call scholasticism. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
they can be seen in scholars like uh, Ambrose and Augustine. And uh, Ambrose actually converted Augustine, and so Augustine was his uh, pupil. Uh, but uh, they were among the first church fathers who brought Christian ideas and Greek philosophy together. So uh, you notice that it, uh, at this point, we're talking about the Catholic Church because uh, the Catholic, you know, the church as itself has been established at this time period. Hey, Cody, I, I see you're coming on. Welcome to class. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, so they're bringing this into the Catholic Church, uh, the use of philosophy to explain the church doctrines and so forth. Um, and uh, while the early church father used philosophy and others thought it wasn't appropriate. So you're seeing a movement to use philosophy more as you go forward uh, here. And um, so uh, scholastic period, um, philosophical systems, the speculative tendencies of various medieval Christian thinkers uh, occurred during this time period. Uh, and they worked out of a fixed religious dog dogma, but they, they sought to solve uh, in new ways, general philosophical problems such as faith and reason, will and intellect, realism and nominalism, and uh, uh provability of the existence of god and things like that and uh so they would involve theology but also uh philosophy and so uh they worked under the influence of mystical institutional tradition of patristic philosophy you know so uh, uh that's the the catholic church and its teachings were becoming institutionalized from 300 12 on, and uh, so the further you go into that time period, uh, you'll see the use of philosophy in various ways. For example, uh, Augustinianism, uh, and then later through Aristotelian philosophical influence, uh, uh, and uh, those type of things will become uh, uh, more involved in doing theology. And uh, there becomes this uh, emphasis on dialectical reason, reasoning to extend knowledge by inference and resolve the contradictions. And so um, when you start reading in the scholastic period, you'll, you'll see this dialectic reasoning being used a lot. All right, uh, some two examples just uh, of this uh, time period, Anselm of Canterbury, uh, who was a Benedictine monk. Uh, he's re frequently referred to as the father of scholasticism since he was the first to employ dialectics in philosophy or theology in a way that would later become a standard with scholastic authors. And uh, probably the most famous is Thomas Aquinas, a uh, Dominican friar, uh, was a scholastic who also used Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, in his theological studies. And he was quite a prodigious writer. To this day, we read his stuff. And uh, uh, he made a huge impact on the Catholic Church and he became a standard of uh, interpretation and doctrine uh, through his writings. Uh, he, he wasn't actually uh, an important figure during his time, but as time went forward and they, read his uh, works, uh, he became a very important theologian and perhaps the most important one in Catholic theology. And so uh, uh, so realize that this scholastic period uh, is a, quite a, a, a long period. But again, uh, they, uh, philosophy was mixed in with theology and uh, uh, ways of reasoning to understand things. All right, um, that's where we're gonna stop uh, this uh, second uh, session. And uh, we'll uh, move on to the third.